Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm going to be talking about the many books I read in the first half of February. Okay, so it is February 15th and I guess technically because February is a short month, yeah no, that's like, it's like, it's about halfway, about halfway through. It's a shorter month than usual. Also, I have just been really blowing through audiobooks and e-arcs and I'm not exactly sure how this happened but I somehow have managed to read 20 things in the first half of February which is a whole hell of a lot like that might be the most I've done in a mid-month wrap-up and so this is gonna be a long video sorry about that settle in um, in terms of how the reading has been going it has definitely been a mixed bag I have had some disappointments, some books that were good but maybe not favorites. I've had some highlights and some lowlights and I've also been kind of more brutally DNFing books. So I have three DNFs to talk about just in the first half of the month. Yay! <laughs> Fun times. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and dive in. If you are new to my mid-month wrap-ups, the way that I do these is I talk about all the books that I read in chronological order, except for my DNFs. So I'm just gonna talk about all those at the beginning, but after that it'll be in chronological order. At the end of the month, when I do my end-of-month wrap-ups, I talk about all the books that I read from lowest rated to highest rated, but for this mid-month wrap-up, I'm just gonna talk about them in the order that I read them. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into my DNFs. <laughs> The first one was kind of a bummer because I had a New York, I bought a physical copy, I had high hopes for it, and yeah, this did not work for me. This is The Dating Plan by Sarah Desai. So this is an adult contemporary romance with a fake engagement trope to it. I tend to like that as a romance trope. I had not read anything from Sarah Desai before so I was excited to give this a try. Obviously I got the Book of the Month Club edition because it was one of the options. Yeah I was not a fan. I liked the heroine. She's quirky, she's a software engineer. I liked her a lot. I did not like the hero. He was kind of an asshole and uh, it was like I think supposed to be played off as like cute banter when he was like saying crappy things about the things that the heroine likes and like making fun of her for doing things like wanting to go get coffee or go to an indie film and like oh that's so dumb. And I'm like oh, okay like let's go watch a sports game instead because that's so much cooler. I, I just guys I he I found him to be so irritating. I was like, I am not shipping them together. I no. And for me, a romance, like a successful romance is going to make me root for the couple. If I am not rooting for the couple, if I don't want them to be together, if I really don't like the hero or I really don't like the heroine and like the other one and whatever, like it is not a successful romance for me. And there was just like, this wasn't going to work for me, especially because it's not one of those things where you're supposed to think that the hero is being a jerk and he's gonna grow and learn from it. No, no, it's written like clearly the author thinks it's cute. And I'm like, it ain't cute, I don't like it. So I DNF'd it, that was a bummer. Um, <laughs> my second DNF was also really unfortunate. This is a book that I had been anticipating for quite a long time. It's been on my TBR shelf for a while and this was the pick from one of my patrons who wanted me to see me read and review it this month and I reached out to her and I was like hey I have some issues with this book like how do you feel if I DNF it and you can pick something else and she was like that's fine thank you I will probably also be now unhauling this book uh so yeah that is The Tiger's Daughter by Kay Arsenault Rivera um okay so I loved the idea of this, a epic fantasy with an FF romance centering Asian women, like it sounded like it could be really really great. I had heard some good things about it early on and then maybe not so great things about later books in the series but I was still excited to have this. I even have a signed copy. Um, sadly, <laughs> I started reading it and number one I had some issues with the narrative choices. It was I don't know, she made some interesting choices. Part of the book is written in second person as a series of letters, but the way it's done doesn't necessarily make the most sense. A lot of the narrative was like not that interesting. And on top of that, there were a few things I read in the first, like, I think I got, I got about a third of the way into this. And there were some things 
in the first third of it that I was uncomfortable with and so I decided I'm gonna pause and go look at reviews and see if it's just me. It was not just me. Some of the ways that she describes the women in this book are kind of offensive and then I read some reviews which I will link down below if you are interested by own voices reviewers because the author was writing kind of a, a, a fantasy pulling randomly from Korean, Chinese, and Japanese cultures, but apparently not doing a very good job of it and not having done a lot of research. Um, and yeah, so there's like a lot, there's a lot of stuff. And so I was like, okay, between the fact that I'm not really liking the story, I'm not liking some of the choices she's making. Other reviewers have had issues with the things that she's done. I, I don't, this is not something I want to read. So sadly, I have DNF'd this, which is a bummer. I will be unhauling it from my shelves. <laughs> and my final DNF was an e-arc that I had for review. This is Duchess If You Dare by Annabelle Bryant. This is a historical romance that sounded really great. It sounded right up my alley. It was kind of pitched as this like women who secretly do all these things to fight social for social justice and like I don't know it sounded like it was going to be great and really fun. I ended up having a lot of issues with it and my little review on Goodreads is like a mini rant. <laughs> if you want to check that out my Goodreads is always linked down below. Um, I, I don't rate my DNFs but I do review them and write a little bit about why I chose to DNF them. This one I had some major issues with the condescending and patronizing way that it was approaching sex work and sex workers. And yeah, I'm not going to get into all of that here. I talk about it more in depth in my Goodreads review, but I was not here for it, on top of which I was kind of uninterested in the characters and the relationship. So between those things, I was like, yeah, I'm not I'm not loving this. I'm just going to DNF. And I do not regret any of those choices. I'm very happy to have not continued with this. So those are the, my three DNFs in the first half of the month, more than usual, but I think I'm also at a point where I'm like, I have so many things to read. If I have major issues with something, why am I reading it? Like, it sh I, I'm, no. That said, let's go ahead and move on to all the books that I did finish this month. The first one was an audio review copy that I had from NetGalley, a nonfiction collection of essays that was very interesting. It's called Why Wakanda Matters, edited by Sheena C. Howard. This is a fascinating collection of essays from professionals in mental health fields, research in psychology, social science, etc all talking about Black Panther and Wakanda and using it as a jumping off point to talk about issues of identity and culture and mental health and spirituality and taking a look at the positive and sometimes even negative aspects of the role of the Black Panther film and franchise. It was very interesting and I just thought it was really cool to use this big pop culture moment as a way of talking about really important issues like like mental health and trauma in the black community and other things. So if that sounds at all of interest, I would definitely recommend it. It's not a super long book, and I do think even though most of the authors are academics, they make it fairly accessible for the typical reader. So I thought this was really good, and I gave it four stars. Then for Blackathon, I'm reading for Team SFF, and I decided to pick up the group book. I got this as an audiobook from my library. It is The Lesson by Cadwell Turnbull. So this was a very interesting book. It was not necessarily what I was expecting, but ultimately I did end up liking it for what it was. That said, <laughs> you should probably know going in what it is and what it isn't. What I was expecting from it was a alien first contact sci-fi story, which Technically it is, but I would call this literary science fiction. It has bits and pieces of the actual alien interaction element, and there are some things that it's doing that I think are very interesting and very smart, but a lot of it is pretty character driven. A lot of it is more of a literary style and approach to the writing. I am glad that I read it though. It was very interesting. It's set in the Virgin Islands and the author is from the Virgin Islands, which I don't know that I've read anything set there before. And it follows these people and these families as they deal with this alien invasion and the things that happen from it. So deeply character driven, really interesting, and it's definitely using the aliens as a metaphor for talking about themes of colonization and enslavement. 
yeah, I thought it was very interesting. It wasn't what I was expecting. I didn't always love everything about it, but I thought it was really good. And if that is the kind of thing that would appeal to you, if like a more literary take on a sci-fi novel sounds of interest, I would recommend it. And I gave this one four stars. Next, I read a middle grade nonfiction book that was sent to me for review from Macmillan Kids. This is Gone to the Woods, Surviving a Lost Childhood by Gary Paulson. Gary Paulson is the author of Hatchet, which is a very well-known children's classic. It's a survival story. And this is the first time he has ever really opened up about his own childhood, his own experiences, and the ways that that somewhat informed the books that he wrote. What's really interesting about this as a memoir is it's written in third person as if it's an adventure story instead of written the way that memoirs typically are. And it's definitely targeted at an older middle grade audience in the way that it that it handles things. But I found this to be fascinating and really moving. Gary Paulson experienced a very difficult childhood. He experienced a lot of trauma. And um, yeah, like it wasn't roses and sunshine and you really see where very early on some of his connection to the land and the forest inspired some of the books he wrote later but also the the need to survive with very little at times so this was an intense one but I really loved it and one of the most moving things like honestly I got choked up reading it but one of the most moving things in this is when he's a teenager an, an adult who has a really huge impact on his life is a librarian. And oh my goodness, like just reading about the impact of this librarian who slowly pulled him into reading and opened up his world to other things and gifted him his first pencil and notebook to get him started writing. Like, ah, oh, it's just like so emotional. It's really beautiful. I would for sure recommend it. I think it's fantastic. And I did give this one five stars. Thank you so much to Macmillan Kids for sending it along. I'm really glad I read it. Next, I read a book that was on my TBR for the Black Author Readathon, which is about reading romances by Black authors. This was an audiobook from the Audible Plus catalog, and it is Touch Me by Alexandria House. I had heard a lot of really good things about Alexandria House and had been wanting to give her a try, and so I was like, well, this is perfect because two of her audiobooks, two of her black romances are available for free with Audible Plus if you, if you are an Audible Plus member. And so I was like, cool. I will listen to these. This one is a contemporary romance between a woman who is a professor at a historically black university and an artist in residence who is coming for the semester to work at the university and it's their relationship. I had kind of mixed feelings about this. There was a lot that I liked about the characters, about the themes that she was dealing with, and then there were things that like didn't quite work for me. I felt like, especially in this one, the sexual relationship between the two of them just started so fast. It felt like insta-lovey to me, which some people really like in their romance. Like I know people who kind of want it jumped into the physical right away. It's not my preference. And so for me, I was like, wow, okay, like that's really fast. Like you don't know each other all that well, but okay. Um, there was a lot of miscommunication that happened. And yeah, so I don't know, like it was kind of a mixed thing. There was a lot that I liked about it, especially when it was getting more into the history of some of their families and the history of the people who founded this black university and black spiritualism. So there were things in it that I really enjoyed and I I didn't dislike the romance but there were just things that I was like this isn't quite my cup of tea maybe I'll try something else from her but I think a lot of what she's doing is really great and really beautiful. I love the covers. I love that she's writing romances where two black people find love together and deals with healing and mental health. Like there's a lot to like and then there's little stuff that I'm just like this is not for me. So I ended up giving this one three stars, a little bit of a mixed bag, but I can see why there are people who really would enjoy what she's doing. Then I read another e-arc. This is The Castle School for Troubled Girls by Alyssa Scheinmel. It is coming out in March. And um, okay, this is another one where the way that it's marketed is kind of inaccurate to the type of book it is. I liked it, but it was not what I was expecting. Based on the marketing, I was expecting it to be kind of this creepy mystery thriller set at this girl's boarding school for troubled girls. And that, that's really not what it is. Uh, it, it, it's really not a mystery thriller. There's really not much tension. I was like waiting for it. And then I eventually realized, 
oh, okay, that's just not what this, this book is. It is a hard-hitting contemporary novel about mental health in teenagers, which is great. And I think it does a great job. It explores a lot of different types of mental health problems. It's a book about healing. It's a book about understanding where people are really coming from and the things that might lead to them acting out or lead to, uh, you know, things resulting from trauma that they experience. You know, I liked the journey that our heroine goes on because she is dealing with grief from the death of her best friend. And she's in a school with 11 other girls, all of whom have their own mental health issues. If you do need content warnings, especially for mental health and self-harm related stuff, check out my Goodreads review. I do have them listed there because it does get quite intense at times. But I thought this was very well done. I thought it was a really beautiful book. It's just not the book I was expecting. <laughs> So I wanted to give you guys a heads up for that. If that sounds appealing, I would definitely recommend it because I think it does a good job for what it is. It's just not a thriller. I ended up giving The Castle School for Troubled Girls four stars. Next, from my library, I got the audiobook for my very final Riley Sager. I read Final Girls and this I think is actually Riley Sager's debut. I, I feel like I practically read his books in like reverse order, which is fine. I ended up really enjoying this quite a bit. It's a thriller following a woman who is a final girl, which means she is the only person who survived a mass murder or a, an attack that killed all of her friends. And she has selective amnesia. She cannot remember most of the events of what took place. And she is one of three final girls in America from events like this. And things kind of get going when one of the other final girls turns up dead. Maybe suicide, maybe murder, and that's all I'm going to say <laughs> about the plot. I really liked this. I thought it was really interesting. It definitely held my attention. I liked what he did with it. I, you know, I think... I, I really enjoy Riley Sager as an author. I like the project of a lot of what he's doing because he writes these interesting mysteries and thrillers and kind of semi-horror novels, but there's always kind of underlying themes that he's tackling as well, and his books tend to be more on the side of feminist ideas and progressive ideas, and he's got bigger stuff he's wanting to tackle and difficult things he's wanting to tackle. So I think Final Girls is no different. I really liked it a lot. I gave it four and a half stars. And um, in case you're wondering, because I feel like people have such different opinions on their favorite and least favorite Riley Sager books, and a lot of it probably just has to do with what you enjoy in your thrillers or mysteries or whatever. But in case you're wondering, my rating of the books, I will tell you, I'll put them in order uh, now that I've read them all. My least favorite, and even the least favorite, I still enjoyed. I think I gave this like three and a half or four stars. Um, but my least favorite was Lock Every Door, then Final Girls, then The Last Time I Lied, and I think unpopularly, Home Before Dark is my favorite. Uh, that does not seem to be a popular opinion. I don't feel like most people love this. It is a gothic horror novel. It's very slow paced. I, I love a gothic so I'm, I'm probably biased because it's tropes that I'm a huge fan of, but uh, yeah, there it is. That is my, my ordering for all the Riley Sager books so far, and I'm definitely going to be reading Survive the Night later this year. So happy that I did that. I liked it. I gave it four and a half stars. Then I did a buddy read with Charles from Books on Stereo, and this was a blended read. I listened to part of it on audio and read part of it physically. Uh, but we read These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong. Um, I love the cover of this book and the premise is really interesting. The execution was a little bit of a mixed bag for me, to be honest. There are things that I thought the author did really well and things that kind of fell flat. I, I think what I'm coming away from this with is I would be really excited to read like this author's third book. <laughs> like once she's kind of like fine-tuned things, um, I think there's something there. There are things that if she can hone in on the stuff she's good at could be really good. And I think what's good here is she has some really interesting characters. If you don't know what this is, it is a re loose, it is loosely inspired by Romeo and Juliet, but set in a magical, not really even magical, semi-speculative alternate 1920s Shanghai. And Roma and Juliet are from competing gangs in Shanghai. And 
the probably one of my favorite things about this book is I was here for having a murderous Juliet. She is a total badass and I really enjoyed that. Also there are horror elements of this book that are kind of spoilery so I won't get into them but I thought that those were written really well and were really interesting. Places that this book fell short for me, number one the pacing. It is definitely longer than it needs to be if, if it's going to be this long it really needed to have more tension and more twists than it did. It dragged a lot through the middle of the book and I was kind of bored for a good chunk. The beginning is good, the ending is fantastic, there are elements of it that are done really well. I also thought that the way that she depicted Shanghai during this pivotal turning point was really interesting where it's pulled between colonial forces and local forces and crime gangs. That all I thought was also very interesting, but the pacing is kind of off. And the other thing about this is that it may be a Romeo and Juliet retelling, but for that, like, there is really not romance. Like, the, the, the romance is super bland. There is little to no chemistry between our Romeo and Juliet. You're lacking the angst and the longing that you might be expecting from a Romeo and Juliet retelling, so I just didn't think that was done super well. So yeah, this was a little bit of a mixed bag. I think she does a good job with the sort of vicious, interesting characters. I thought she did a good job with the horror elements, and I also really enjoyed some of the side characters. Like, some of the characters were fantastic. One of my favorites was a trans woman who is one of Juliet's cousins, and she was super interesting. So yeah, there were things that I liked about this, things that I didn't. I ended up landing on three stars, kind of a mixed bag for me. Then again for the Black Author Readathon, I read another romance. This one is a novella from one of my favorite authors, Talia Hibbert. I read Damaged Goods. This is part of the Ravenswood series and it's following a side character that we met in an earlier book who has now left an abusive marriage and gone to the seaside town and is super pregnant and reconnects with her childhood sweetheart or like her teen her teen sweetheart. I really enjoyed this. I thought it was so charming and sweet. It is kind of intense. It does deal with a history of domestic violence and so some of that is described from the past relationship. So content warnings for that. But yeah, I mean, as always, I just think Talia's writing totally works for me. I loved this as a romance. It worked for me as a novella. And I gave Damaged Goods four and a half stars. Then I read another e-arc. This one sadly was disappointing. <laughs> it was very disappointing. This is Phoenix Flame by Sarah Holland. It is the sequel to Havenfall, which came out last year. I really enjoyed Havenfall, especially the world and the descriptions of the setting, and um, had high hopes for this. I liked the idea. We have a bisexual heroine in kind of a love triangle, which could have been really interesting. There, there was a lot here that had potential. <sighs> This was just, it wasn't great and it was super underdeveloped. It was very, very short and not in a good way. Like it, it felt very rushed. It felt like it was like, well, we have the bones of a plot and we're just gonna kind of throw this together and say we're done. Again, the best thing about this is the writing involving the descriptions of the place and places, the ideas behind the portal fantasy, but there were plot holes the character arcs didn't always make a lot of sense. There were a lot of things that felt kind of contrived that happened for the sake of the plot, not because they really made sense. And if I'm enjoying a book, I can suspend disbelief to a certain point with that and just kind of go with it. But with this book, like, it was a lot. And even though we get this love triangle, there is not a satisfying conclusion to the romantic arc either. So I don't know what happened here. It, yeah, I don't I don't know what happened. I gave it two stars. It was disappointing. It's the end of the duology and like there was so much potential for this to have been really great, really interesting, and it unfortunately wasn't. So that was a bummer. Then I read one of the final historical novellas by Alyssa Cole that I had not yet read. This is Let Us Dream. I think I have one more historic, if I'm not mistaken, I think I have one more historical novella of hers that I haven't read yet, so I'm probably gonna read that soon. But this one is set in almost the 1920s, it's like 1919. It follows a black woman in Harlem who runs a burlesque club and the hero is a undocumented immigrant from India, a Muslim Indian man. And I, I really loved this. I mean, Alyssa Cole, 
is always just great and this was really cute and really charming. I loved seeing their relationship slowly come together even though it's a novella like she does a good job of helping you feel the passage of time. It's kind of a friends to lovers romance and she works in a lot of important thematic content dealing with things of immigration, dealing with women's rights. It's set during the women's suffrage movement and also sex workers rights and stuff. So I just thought this was very very good unsurprisingly if a little bit shorter than maybe I wanted it to be and I gave this one four stars. Then for a book that I am not going to say too much about here because there is going to be a live show on my channel pretty soon. I will put all the details down below but this is for a read-along I'm doing with Ashley over a bookish realm. We are reading the Song of the Lioness Quartet by Tamora Pierce and I reread for the umpteenth time <laughs> Alana the First Adventure which is the first book in that series. This is a younger YA like maybe the first book almost could be middle grade but like younger YA series that came out in the 80s that I love. This is one of my all-time favorites, childhood favorites. I've reread it many times over the years and uh, it was just so much fun to revisit it yet again definitely a comfort read. I will say on this reread there were a couple of things that stood out to me reading it in 2020 that I don't think I noticed early on um, and so we'll probably talk about some of that in the live show. I'm not going to get into it too much here but like it's still five stars. I love it. Wh who are we kidding? So um, yeah that was that was a lot of fun. Join us for the live show if you want to hear that conversation. Then I read another book that I'm going to be part of a live show for. This is for the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club and the live show for this is going to be on I think the last Saturday of the month hosted over on the Naughty Librarians channel. The book club was founded by Amanda from the Naughty Librarian and Leanna from Leanna's Library and myself and Mara from Books Like Whoa are now joining them which has been super fun. So the book pick for February was From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. So again we're going to be talking in more detail about this over on her channel but um, I ended up quite enjoying this. I, I for sure see why it's a bit of a polarizing book. I think whether or not you're going to like this is so, so much going to depend on what you're looking for and <laughs> like what you enjoy. I do think if you enjoy Sarah J Mass, not, Jennifer L. Armitrat has like a different writing style from Sarah J Mass, but if you like Sarah J Mass, you will probably really enjoy From Blood and Ash. I would even say that the love interest in this book is somewhat reminiscent of Reese from the Akatar series. So this is a new adult fantasy. It's sold as adult. It's not YA. I know it looks kind of YA. It's not YA. Um, but it's a new adult because the character's pretty young. So I would call it like a new adult fantasy with a heavy romantic plot. It doesn't have an HEA. Uh, so the romance is not necessarily resolved but there is a romantic element through it and I, I don't like I don't want to say too much about this. It can get quite intense. It has a main character who is the victim of physical and psychological and religious abuse and um, there's a couple of pretty intense on-page scenes depicting that which not everyone might want to read. I also think if you go into this expecting more of a romance, if you're more of a romance reader, this might be more fantasy than you're expecting. I, I'm hearing from a lot of my primarily romance reading friends that they thought that it was too long and slow. As somebody who reads a lot of epic fantasy, I flew through this. Like it was such a page turner to me and I really enjoyed it. So I don't know, like it, there, there's a lot to talk about here. I do get into some of it in my Goodreads review and we're going to get into all of it in the live show if you want to join us for that. But basically I don't think this is the book for everyone. I however really liked it a lot and I gave it four and a half stars. Okay then I read four review copies for this vlog that I did. If you haven't seen the vlog I will link it up above. I'm not going to go into detail on any of these books because I talk about them quite a bit in this vlog but I did a thing where I read four books that I needed to get to from Neck Alley that were either mysterious or spooky in some way and um, yeah so check out that video if you want to hear details but briefly I read The Conductors by Nicole Glover. I think it has a great premise. I think once it actually dives more into the mystery plot it does a really good job but it has a lot of excessive scenes that are unnecessary and that really slows the pacing down. So I ended up giving this one three stars. I also read Our Last Echoes by Kate Alice Marshall. This one is a YA I don't know what we would call a supernatural thriller slash horror. 
I really liked it and I gave it four and a half stars. I also read The Drowning Kind by Jennifer McMahon. I had an audio review copy from NetGalley of this one. This is more of a slow burn adult paranormal book. I don't know if I would even call it thriller because it's a slow paced book, but it has like paranormal creepy elements to it. I liked it. I gave it four stars. And then lastly, I read an adult horror novel that is being translated from Swedish. This is The Lost Village by Camilla Sten, and I gave this one five stars. I really loved it. Apparently, <laughs> that is an unpopular opinion. <laughs> like, I don't know. So, you know, if you want to get a feel for whether it would be the book for you or not, maybe check out my Goodreads review because after reading other people's reviews, I tried to unpack a little bit why other people seem not to be liking this and I really did but it was definitely my type of horror it's slower and quieter it slowly builds the creep factor and builds the dread it's very atmospheric very eerie and it's got some interesting topics that it's dealing with one thing that I will say about this check more detailed content warnings in the Goodreads review if you need them but you should be aware that this book includes abuse of and violence towards a severely mentally disabled woman and uh that does get quite intense so like if that is a an, something that would be an issue for you i would look into that before reading it there are other content warnings as well but like that's one that i wanted to kind of put at the forefront out here so then i had an audio review copy from the penguin random house volumes app of tristan strong destroys the world by kwame mbalia this is the second tristan strong book and i really liked it this is part of a middle grade series about a black boy from chicago who discovers this kind of alternate world of stories and african stories and i really loved this again like other people seem not to be liking it as much as i did but i really really loved it <laughs> At the beginning of the book, Tristan is dealing with symptoms of PTSD from the trauma he experienced in book one. And I appreciated that. I liked the way that it was trying to tackle mental health issues for a middle grade audience. I was seeing some reviews where people were frustrated that it didn't focus more on that and that it didn't go farther with that. But part of me feels like, okay, this is, but this is like an adventure story for children. So I'm like is it really bad that we're not going full on into the mental health trauma stuff and just like somewhat addressing it I don't know anyway I really liked it a lot I think it's really interesting I liked the humor there's a lot of like dad jokes <laughs> which like, I don't know, it landed for me. I thought it was entertaining. I also liked the way that this addresses ideas like the African diaspora and the way that that affects community and storytelling. And uh, it, it deals with cultural appropriation in an interesting way that's like age appropriate. I just really enjoyed it a lot. I gave it five stars. Um, I think it's a really good middle grade book. So yeah, I thought it was good. We're like, getting through these. I'm I'm actually kind of impressed. I thought this was going to be like a much longer process. The next book I read was another novella that I had on audio from Scribd. This is The Haunting of Tramcar 015 by P. Jelly Clark. It is the second book in the series that takes place in this like alternate history steampunk version of Cairo and uh has like kind of procedural mysteries but with gin and like spirits and stuff and um yeah I really liked this I was a little disappointed because I was hoping this would follow the main character from the first short story in the series and it didn't which was kind of a bummer because I really liked her but I did still enjoy this pretty well one thing that I just think is amazing about his work in general is he's able to cram so much culture and history and like just depth into these very short works of fiction and I think it's impressive. I actually lived in Cairo for a while and so it was fun for me. Like he doesn't explain it so much but just like throws in things that are cultural things in Egypt and I thought that was cool. It deals with the history of colonization although in this alternate world things have ended a little bit differently and there's also a lot of kind of feminist ideas beneath the surface as well. This one is addressing issues of women's suffrage on the side. It's not like the main plot. The main plot is this dude who's a detective trying to figure out why this tram car is haunted and like that's the main plot but it integrates all of these other little details so there's a women's suffrage vote that's happening during the book that it addresses and it deals with gender roles and I just I really liked it I like 
what he's doing. I'm very excited to read the first full-length novel in the series, which I have an advanced copy for, so I will definitely be reading that one for review. This one I just wanted a little bit more of, and I think I was less interested in this than I was in the first one, but it was still good. I'm still happy I read it, and I gave it three and a half stars. It was kind of like in between a three and a half and a four. I think I rounded up on Goodreads, but three and a half. Then I read the first of 10 books that I'm going to be reading in the next couple of months that I cannot talk to you about until July. <laughs> so that's interesting. I'm a judge for the Vivians, which is a romance competition run through the RWA. And so I am reading and judging romance novels. And I read the first one of the 10 that I need to read in the next like six weeks. You will hear about them. <laughs> Maybe I'll do like a whole video talking about all the books and like how it went when I'm able to in July. I basically can't talk about any of the books that I'm assigned or any of the books I read or how they go until they announce the winner in the summer. So I, I, I'm still going to kind of include them in my stats for the month because it is reading that I'm doing. I just won't be talking about these books specifically. And the final book that I read this month was another audiobook that I had for review from Libro FM. So thank you to them. They give me a small selection of books that I can download every month in exchange for talking about them. They're a great audiobook service and there's always a link down below if you want to check them out. But I finally got around to listening to Boyfriend Material by Alexis Hall. This is one that I had been a little nervous about because I had heard some not so great reviews of it. But guys, I loved it. <laughs> Like, is this the theme of February? Me loving things that other people don't like? I, th I think that might be it. I don't know. I just thought it was such a delight. This might sound strange, but go with me for a minute. Basically, if Lorelai Gilmore was a gay British man, you would have somebody a lot like the main character from this book. <laughs> Seriously, that is totally the energy that he's bringing to this book. That messy, chaotic energy of like approaching life and having issues, but also this really high octane banter. And I was here for it. I think if you can go into it imagining that and you're into the Gilmore Girls and you like that type of humor, you might really enjoy this. If you don't like the Gilmore Girls, because there are people who are totally turned off by that level of banter or those types of characters. If you don't like the Gilmore Girls, you're probably not going to like boyfriend material. But if you do like the Gilmore Girls, you really should try it because it was such a charming romantic comedy. It is also an opposites attract romance with a fake dating plot. So he's fake dating this guy who's this very kind of buttoned up lawyer and it was it was just so so funny. It made me laugh. I really enjoyed it. Are they messy? Is there lots of drama? Yeah for sure but I had such a good time with it. Also what's kind of cool about this is it is a male male romance that is own voices for the gay representation. The author is a gay man writing gay romance. So if you're wanting that in your romance this is a good option. And lastly I would say this one is also pretty low on the steam factor. If you don't really want a lot of explicit on-page sex in your books this might be another one to check out. There are a couple of on-page, sort of on-page sex scenes, but they're not really explicitly described. So anyway, FYI, I really enjoyed it. I gave it five stars. It made me laugh. It was so much fun. I'm really glad I got around to it. So there you go. Those are <laughs> the 20 things that I read in the first half of the month. I will say, I mean, how many of them were novellas though? Like seriously, because I did read a lot of novellas. In fact, the romance thing I read for judging was a novella so yeah I mean so like four of them were novellas I feel like I've been reading a lot anyway <laughs> there it is hopefully this was interesting or helpful and I know some of you guys were also wanting to hear my take on some of these books and so I'm hoping that between what I said here and or my Goodreads reviews it'll give you some idea of whether these books are going to work for you or not because some of them are books where I'm like yeah I really liked this but if you don't like this thing, you might not like this book. So talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, tell me about a book that you really love that other people don't like. I mean, that's the theme of the video, right? So tell me about something for you where you hear a lot of negative reviews of this book, but you just really liked it anyway. Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more, and if you want to support the work of the channel, check out the Patreon linked down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.